Okay, we are continuing with the link layer, and uh, we want to uh, study switched LANs, Ethernet, um, that uh, <clears throat> are widely used uh, in, in corporate um, environments. So this is 6.4 uh, from uh, our uh, textbook. Um, we 6.7 will be self-study for you. The first thing we we notice is that IP is 32 bit, um, but uh, link layer addressing is 48 bit. So this is much longer, and because it's much longer, usually it's written in hexadecimal. So for example, this is a hexadecimal um, MAC address, 48 bit MAC address. So what are the differences between uh, IP addressing and MAC addressing? Okay, each adapter in the um, local area network uh, will have a unique LAN address. So this is your network, network adapter and it has an address, this one has an address. So no two addresses on the LAN uh, will be the same. It's kind of similar to IP, you know, the IP has to be unique um, in, in the internet. So these uh, LAN um, addresses are also uh, unique. So interestingly, MAC addresses allocation uh, is done by IEEE, Institute for Electrical and Electronic Engineers, which is the largest uh, professional um, uh, body uh, in the world. Um, uh, and there is a 24-24 split for the 48-bit uh, MAC address. So the first 24-bit is allocated to a manufacturer so if you are a manufacturer and you want to produce um, um, adapter cards, then you have to apply to IEEE to get your 24-bit uh, company address. And once you have that, uh, then you can produce uh, 2 to the power 24 um, different adapter cards uh, with different numbers. Uh, so you, you can see um, this ensures uh, uniqueness for every adapter card that we have in the world and uh, interestingly this is flat so what I what I mean by flat is that all 48 bits is just one address it's not like IP where you have uh, the hierarchy called the network address and then uh, the host address and we'll talk about that later So uh, let's see what are the differences between MAC addresses and IP addresses. So first of all, MAC addresses are hard-coded in the read-only memory when the adapter is built. And in some adapters, it can be actually reprogrammed uh, through some uh, special uh, devices and mechanisms. Uh, and it is flat, so um, there, there, is, uh, there is no network address associated with it. So the, the implication is that it's, it's portable. It means that you can take your device, your laptop, for example, from one IP subnet and plug it in, in another IP subnet. And that MAC address is still valid because it's, uh, it doesn't have a uh, net ID uh, part. Uh, in contrast, um, IP is hierarchical. And that's why um, you cannot reuse the same IP address if you change your subnet. Also, IP address is configured or learned dynamically, such as through DHCP. This is kind of a software address, um, uh, not hard-coded in the hardware. So uh, the, the last bullet is saying that the IP is used to get a packet from uh, one IP subnet to anywhere in the world. Uh, but the MAC is used to send a packet from within the subnet, from one um, machine to another machine within the same IP subnet. So it's more like a local area network, or uh, that's, that's the data link layer. So let's have a look at um, um, how we actually name and address our machines and what sort of uh, mechanisms are there to go from one address to the other. So what you see here is that a machine will actually be named by three different ways. So this is the application layer name, right? So we know, for example, www.cse.unsw.ad.au. This is a name. 
and a machine uh, can have an IP address 129.94.242.51 and that machine might have an Ethernet address like 45cc 4e12 and things like that. So the question is how we know from one to the other, how do we map them? So here you can see we use DNS between application layer and the network layer. And we have already uh, studied DNS. But how do we uh, map IP address to the uh, MAC address? So that's done through a protocol called ARP, Address Resolution uh, Protocol, that we are going to see uh, soon. So here you can see a local area network. Every machine has an IP address allocated and uh, its adapter Ethernet address. And the question is, um, if this machine wants to send a packet to this machine, it knows the IP address. But how does it know what is the MAC address for a given IP address? So this is done through ARP table. So every machine has an ARP cache or ARP table maintained, which is basically these two columns, IP address and the corresponding MAC address. And TTL is the time that this uh, entry will be valid. And after that, it will be erased. These are like the dynamic ones. And uh, typically, this is 20 minutes. It can be 60 minutes. Um, and this table uh, is maintained by every host. And this is dynamic table. Um, it is growing and then sometimes uh, shrinking, depending on what, how much communication is happening between this host and any other host. So let's have a look at the steps uh, that are used uh, by this ARP protocol to build and maintain and use this table. So for example, A wants to send a datagram to B, right? This is the simplest example. Uh, so A can figure out the IP address of uh, B, for example, through um, DNS lookup. It finds out this is the IP address, and now it wants to send the IP packet inside the Ethernet frame. But it needs the destination Ethernet address, the MAC address for B. How does it find it? It doesn't know. It's not in its table in the beginning. So what it does, it broadcasts a query, ARP query, right? saying uh, the uh, the destination MAC address is FF, FF, FF. So it's, it's all ones. It means that it's, it's broadcast. It means every single adapter card connected to this local area network will process it. So everyone receives it. B will also receive it, and B will respond because um, B's IP address matches uh, the IP address uh, in this IP packet. So when it goes to the IP layer, then B will, will, will respond. And it can respond to A because in the, uh, A had a source, uh, source uh, Ethernet uh, address, right, when it sent the um, Ethernet packet. So it can use that source as a destination. So this time it's unicast. So what you see here is that the reply, ARP reply is unicast, but ARP transmission query is broadcast. So when A receives this packet from B, then it can uh, create an entry in its ARP table or ARP cache, right? So um, you can see this is a plug and play uh, because there is no human intervention. There is no manual entry. There is no manual process uh, required to create this table. This is done automatically by the protocol. Now we are going to see how um, actually a host can transmit uh, a packet uh, from one subnet to another subnet when you have to traverse a router uh, using uh, two addresses, IP and the MAC address. So let's have a look at this uh, figure here. At the left-hand side, we have um, a subnet, and the right-hand side, we have another subnet, and they are connected together uh, via this router R. And every host, every node here, whether it's a host or a router, you can see there is an IP address and then there is a, an adapter address, right? And this is for every interface. 
So these hosts have a, uh, have single interfaces here, but the router uh, has two different interfaces left and right here. Okay, so let's start our tracing. Um, so A wants to send a datagram to B, right? And uh, it will go via R, and we want to see uh, how IP addresses and MAC addresses interplay. So first we assume that the A knows B's IP address, right? So you might ask how. How does A know B's IP address? Well, if you remember that you can use DNS uh, to um, solve the name of B and get this IP address. So A knows B's IP address is 222.222 and, and, and so on. A also knows that B is not in the local subnet here at the left. And uh, you might ask again, how can A know that? Well, uh, you remember that IP uh, address is hierarchical. So if you look at the net ID, and if you have the mask, if you have the subnet mask, then uh, you can find out the net ID of B. And uh, from uh, the net ID, you can see that uh, B will have a different net ID and uh, the subnet mask is discovered via DHCP. So when you get the uh, IP address, you also get the uh, mask from DHCP, if you remember. We also assume that A knows the IP address of the first hop router. So A now knows that the B is not here in this subnet. So what would be the first hop router? What would be the gateway to get out of this subnet? And that information is also obtained from DHCP, if you remember. Finally, we assume that A knows R's MAC address. So A in its table, it knows the MAC address of B. Uh, sorry, the MAC address of R. And uh, we have already seen that um, a few minutes ago that uh, the ARP table can be dynamically built uh, through ARP protocol. So armed with that information, now we are going to look at this animation to see how uh, the addresses are changing, uh, both IP uh, and the MAC. Okay, so first thing you see here is the source IP address is the source, uh, IP address of A and the destination IP address is the destination IP address of B. And... Um, this IP packet is go from IP to Ethernet layer. So once it goes to the Ethernet layer, we need the source Ethernet MAC address. So this is the MAC address of A, and the destination is the uh, destination uh, address of R here. So now this Ethernet frame is ready to be transmitted. So if you transmit it, then... Um, it will go through the subnet and it will be picked up by the uh, Ethernet adapter card at the router R. And then um, it, it will um, decapsulate the IP packet from the payload of Ethernet and give it to the IP layer. When it gives it to the IP layer, then the IP layer can see, ah, okay, uh, the destination IP address is 222.222.222, so it can use this uh, forwarding table and uh, it can uh, transmit uh, through this interface to this, to this subnet because this is the subnet address for this one. So this packet will be now transmitted through this adapter, so we need to find out what will be the source and destination MAC address. So when it goes to the Ethernet layer, you can see that the source MAC address is the MAC address of this interface, 1A, starts with 1A, and the destination is the MAC address of this one. So you can see the source and the destination MAC addresses are changing all the time, but the source and uh, destination IP addresses are not changing. They are still the same. So once you transmit it, then it, it will be received by B because you can see B's uh, Ethernet address is 49. So this is the destination 49. So it will be picked up by the adapter card here. See, and then uh, the Ethernet data link layer will decapsulate the IP packet and give it to the IP layer. So we are done. So here we can see how uh, the Ethernet um, or the MAC uh, source and destination addresses are changing hop by hop. 
but the source and IP addresses remain the same. In case you're curious, uh, you can just uh, type ARP-A and you, you can have a look at, at your machine uh, what is the current um, ARP table. Uh, so you can see in this one uh, it has this IP address and the corresponding physical address, uh, which is the uh, MAC address, and uh, whether it's a dynamic or a static. So dynamic means that it, it has to be refreshed, and static means it, it, will, it will remain static. A hacker can actually, um, if, if a hacker uh, is successful in connecting to the LAN somehow, and then they can uh, play some tricks with this ARP table, um, they can reply back to the ARP broadcast query uh, with a fake uh, MAC address. Remember, the, the MAC addresses can be uh, faked uh, because uh, they, they allow some software um, configuration of the MAC address. And if you do that, uh, then uh, this machine uh, will use your fake MAC address and you, you will be receiving uh, all the uh, packets, not, not, not the router. And then you can become the man in the middle and then you can forward to router. So you receive it, then you change something, then you forward to the router. So these kind of things are a bit difficult with the switched. Uh, we'll later see switched Ethernet. Switched Ethernet has more security because you control the switch and you physically um, need to um, take a wire from your desktop to the switch. And that's a bit difficult uh, to uh, hack. Um, so switched Ethernet um, is something that we are going to study next. We are going to have a quick look at the very popular LAN technology uh, called Ethernet. So Ethernet was uh, proposed uh, by Bob Metcalf in Xerox uh, Park, uh, which is in California. Uh, when he was visiting Hawaii. You can see the Aloha was also um, invented when, when the inventor was visiting Hawaii. So it seems like Hawaii is a good destination for um, generating new ideas, uh, at least for computer uh, networking. So this is the original sketch and this is um, it's in the history book and it's, it's, it's discussed and uh, referenced uh, all the time. So what it says is that there is a bus technology and you are going to connect your, um, so this is a cable, this YOLO is a cable and you just connect uh, the devices and if you transmit then it goes through the cable and everyone can hear you. So this was the first widely used LAN technology the re uh, and it was simpler and cheaper than the other LAN technologies that were there at that time, such as the token ring uh, local area network that we have seen before, uh, token passing. And uh, because it became so popular that there were so many Ethernet adapters manufactured in the world that every device now almost uh, has Ethernet uh, adapters. And uh, they started uh, with the 10 megabits per second and they kept up with the speed. Now we have widely deployed 10 gigabits per second Ethernet. So if you look at the physical topology, this left hand side here, we have seen this before. Uh, this was very popular in the 90s, okay, in mid-90s. They used CSMS-CD to uh, detect the collision and CSMA to avoid the collision uh, that we have seen before. But uh, because a lot of uh, bandwidth is wasted uh, because of collision, now we are using this architecture, the star or hub-based, switch-based architecture. So. This is the one that we are going to study here. You can see there is a switch and everyone uh, has uh, its own dedicated um, uh, connection and the, 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 they, they don't collide with each other because the switch takes care of that. Uh, and because of that, uh, you don't actually need any CSMS CD to work when um, you are using a switch. 
We have seen this before. Uh, this is the frame format of Ethernet, the preamble and everything. Um, so I'm going to skip that. And we have also seen that these are six byte source and uh, six byte destination addresses, 48 uh, bits. And we have seen how to calculate CRC uh, for error checking. But these are uh, maybe new to you. Uh, so Ethernet is connectionless. So uh, there is no handshaking. So when the source wants to send, it just sends it. Um, it's unreliable, uh, so it means that uh, if it is dropped, if there are bit errors, for example, CRC, uh, check failed, then uh, the destination or the receiver will simply drop it, and um, the IP packet will be lost. And then at the higher layer, if you're using TCP, for example, TCP will uh, time out and retransmit. Um, and uh, so, that's that's what uh, it is. Ethernet is very much like uh, internet protocol, unreliable and connectionless. Now we are going to look at uh, Ethernet switches. So switches are link layer devices, uh, layer two devices, and uh, they they are active uh, devices, not just passive cables. Um, like, like the cable-based Ethernet. So when we, when we say active, uh, we mean that uh, they can um, store the packet, so they have buffer, and they have intelligence to forward the Ethernet packet. So they can examine the incoming frame's MAC address and selectively forward the MAC to one or more of the outgoing links. And the process is transparent, so, so the hosts don't know that the packets are actually going through the switches. Uh, so the hosts wouldn't know that whether they are connected to a cable-based Ethernet or they are connected to a switch. So this whole thing is transparent. And this is plug-and-play self-learning, so you don't have to configure uh, the switches at all. You just connect to the switches and it works. Um, we are going to see very soon how uh, the switches uh, can self-learn uh, where to forward the packet or frame. So here you can see a switch uh, which has uh, six interfaces um, and it connects six devices uh, A, A prime, B, B prime, C and C prime. And um, here because the, they are active switch and they can buffer um, and then A can communicate with A prime and B can communicate with B prime simultaneously at the same time without colliding. So there is no collision uh, because the packets are buffered in the switches and the switches manages all of this transmission. So as a result, every single link here is its own collision domain. There is no other devices connected. So this is uh, fantastic in terms of performance. So the question is, how does switch know that A prime can be reached via interface four, and for example, B prime can be reached via um, interface five? Uh, there is no manual uh, configuration, uh, and nobody actually enters this information in the switch. So let's see how switch can self-learn these things. So each switch has a switch table, and in the switch table it has the MAC address of the host, and it has the interface to reach that host. So it looks like a routing table. Uh, so the question is, uh, how are these entries created in the switching table? This is some kind of like the routing uh, protocol problem. Uh, in the routing, uh, you know, the routers need to have a table, uh, and who creates that table? Uh, the routing protocols create that table. So here the, the, the switches do not have explicit protocols designed for them, but these are just self-learning, very simple rules that uh, are used by the switches to create that, uh, those tables uh, on the fly, as we are going to see very soon. So here again, uh, let's have, have, a, have a look at the switch with six interfaces and six devices connected. And um, the, the way it works is, uh, when A um, wants to send a frame to A prime, 
then it just sends it to the switch okay and the switch table at that time is uh, at that time is empty you can see that the switch doesn't know where to send right uh, but uh, as soon as this packet comes to the switch uh, then immediately switch knows that if the switch needs to send a packet with MAC address A then interface has to be one so it means that each time it receives a packet or a frame then it knows how to reach that host so this is how it can create its table so the algorithm says that if the table has entry and when it receives a MAC packet, uh, MAC frame, then it can send it to that interface. But what if the table is empty, for example, in the beginning? Then this is what you do. You actually, uh, you, you actually flood. Um, um, okay. Right. So this flooding is, is becomes very, very important, right? So flooding means that uh, a frame comes to the switch uh, and uh, switch doesn't find uh, in the table uh, where to send. Um, in that case, it will flood. It means that it will send that packet uh, to all the other interfaces except the one that it came from. So let's see how it works. So again, here we have our network with six interfaces. And you can see that A wants to send a frame to A prime. So in the beginning, the table is empty. So A sends the frame. The frame comes to the switch. So switch creates this entry that uh, for destination A, the interface has to be one. And for A prime, it cannot find anything, so it broadcasts, it sends to all of them. And A prime will respond, right? And when A prime responds, a, a table entry is created that go to A prime, the interface has to be four. And when A prime sends this frame, the destination is A. This time A can be found in the table, so switch will not broadcast switch will unicast it back to A. So you can see um, the, the switch can actually uh, learn this table and maintain this table on its own. So it's something similar to the ARP um, cache, ARP table that we have seen uh, a few minutes ago. Now let's have a look at how we can interconnect uh, multiple switches to increase the span of your uh, Ethernet in a local area network. So here you can see uh, a switch and uh, it has three interfaces. ABC devices are connected to switch S1. And now we have another switch S2 here connecting three devices, switch three here connecting G, H, and I. And we can have another switch S4, which is not connecting any devices directly, but is connecting three other switches. As a result, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, all these devices can talk to each other through these inner connection of switches. So the question is, how does A know that if it wants, if it wants to send a uh, frame to G here, that it, it has to forward uh, the packet to S4 first? So again, it's self-learning, uh, exactly the way that uh, a switch uh, S1 would learn where to forward the packet if A wants to send to C. So here in this picture, you can see switches and routers, right? So the routers, you can see they have three layers, physical, link, and network, and switches have two layers, physical and link only. So this is a significant difference. So some, uh, so switches are, are link, link layer devices and the routers are network layer devices.
So there are some interesting security issues um, that, that for switches uh, as, as well. Uh, although switches are more robust uh, against attacks because it's not a, a broadcast cable. But uh, if uh, a hacker can connect to a switch somehow, then it can sniff some broadcasts because in the beginning, the switch, if it doesn't have anything, any entry in the table, then it would broadcast. It means that the, the attacker will get it. Switch poisoning is interesting because uh, switch is this forwarding table. And uh, forwarding table means uh, it has um, a, a limited space, right? It's, it has a limited size. So when the table is full, then it cannot... Um, enter any new uh, entries. Uh, so a, a attacker can send bogus uh, uh, packets, uh, lots of them with different MAC addresses. So the table will be full very soon. And then the switch will not be able to enter the legitimate MAC addresses. As a result, then it will be broadcasting all the time because it doesn't find the address in the table. So this, this uh, is a potential uh, attack uh, on switches. But as I said, uh, switches are uh, located in a center location, locked um, and accessed only via uh, legitimate people. So it is harder uh, to uh, attack switches uh, because it's not wireless. So time has come to have a quick look at a quiz. So what do you think? A switch can what? A filter, forward, extend a LAN or everything? Well, the answer is just forward a frame. Okay. Six point seven. Um, I actually leave it to you for self study. Uh, it's basically uh, shows you from the very um, you know in the beginning when you hit the browser how uh, a packet travels through the uh, browser application to uh, HTTP then to TCP, how the DNS works, and then it goes down to the IP layer, then uh, link layer. And so you will see the whole network protocol stack in use. So to summarize uh, what we have learned about link layer, we have learned about error detection and correction. We have learned that in link layer, you might have to uh, share a channel, then you need multiple access. And uh, link layer addressing uh, is a MAC layer addressing uh, that, that is used in conjunction with IP addressing. So how does it work, uh, dual addressing? We have also seen uh, Ethernet and we have seen uh, switched uh, local area networks, which is currently uh, used, uh, widely used. So we are almost done. Uh, so we, we are down to the link layer. We are not going to study physical layer as we have discussed in the beginning of the uh, term uh, that physical layer is not included in this course. So we are pretty much done, except uh, that in the link layer, uh, the most popular uh, link layer is actually uh, the wireless link layer. Uh, so all your laptops, uh, your phones, your iPads, uh, you are not actually using Ethernet. You are using 802.11 Wi-Fi chip. So I think it's important for you to understand how the wireless link layer works. And that's why uh, we have uh, another week to go and we are going to study wireless next. So uh, this is a good time to remind you that uh, the My Experience is now open. Uh, it means uh, that you can go and um, enter uh, your experience um, how, uh, and feedback. Um, and uh, you know that this is confidential, so it means that um, we won't be able to see who is entering what. Um, and the university will manage it. Um, this is um, uh, your opportunity to tell us. Um, and give us any feedback that you have. And I think this is very, uh, very important because uh, every year uh, we collect this feedback and it's through your feedback that uh, we learn um, uh, how to uh, improve our delivery and we get better and better. So I um, urge every one of you uh, to fill in this My Experience. It doesn't take very long. 
So just log in, it's anonymous. Uh, so uh, please uh, do fill it out. 